Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for joining us on this Wednesday. I'm Matt Harrington with the Southwestern Vermont Chamber of Commerce, and we're uh, broadcasting live again out of Cat TV Studios. We want to thank the staff for being here uh, during this COVID crisis. We've been updating you as we move along, uh, especially in this studio uh, when we have the fortunate pleasure to have uh, CEO Tom D, as well as Chief Medical Officer Dr. Trey Dobson joining us. And today we have them joining us again, uh, maintaining six feet of separation. We all walked in with our face masks on, so we're observing observing all the precautions that I know Dr. Dobson's going to speak about again today. Uh, if you're watching live on Facebook and you have questions for Dr. Dobson or Tom, uh, please just have them come through. I'm reading them and the studio is, is monitoring them as well. Um, Tom, let's, let's get right into it. It's been a couple uh, weeks since we've last connected. How is Southwestern Vermont Medical Center doing? Give us an update Well, there. thanks, Matt, for the invitation. Good to be back here. And you know, this continues to be a, a, a paradoxical time for our health healthcare system. It's kind of, in many ways, it's the best of times and the worst of times. Mm -hmm. I mean, from the best standpoint, um, continue to receive tremendous volunteer support from the community. It's been heartwarming, and it's been it's been remarkable. Our our donations, the PPE, has continued to come in, even though we continue to look for. For mass, that that's a that's a challenge right now. Uh, we'll talk more about that in a moment. Our uh, our COVID relief fund has been unbelievable. I mean, I just I'd like to just let people know that uh, we've gotten in support over the last uh, you know four weeks of uh, almost a half a million dollars, which is is remarkable. Very few institutions in the state have had that type of support from the community. Um, our elected officials have stepped up. I mean, our you know, from a from a local standpoint, our select board has been terrific. They've reached out. You know, Trey and I have been there on a couple of occasions. They sent a proclamation of support to the health system. Um, our our state officials, our, um, our our Southern Vermont delegation has been there. They've been talking to us. They've been lending their support. There's a a major. Um, you know, the, the good news is the state received 1.2 billion dollars of COVID relief funds and. And they're, you know, looking at how to allocate those funds, and that will go through the legislative process. Um, our congressional delegation, the, the two senators, uh, Congressman Welsh, have been in constant contact with us and and showing their support. And 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 we we continue to be very optimistic that we'll receive some funding from the from the federal stimulus um, front. And we've received some already, you know, of over three million dollars, which is which is positive. Um, and that's all terrific. Our, we continue to have a reach out from our local organizations. The two colleges have, have contacted us just recently. I know we have meetings with them and, yeah. and, and looking for us to, to partner and, and do innovative things that we can help as they look to, to ramp up their, with their students coming back this fall. Um, you know, and, but incredible support from our workforce. Mm -hmm. Again, all these things are, when I say workforce, I mean staff as well as our physicians. They, they have been amazing in terms of what they've been doing, working long hours, a lot of dedicated work. Our physicians staying ready to help us. Uh, many of them have taken or, or will be taking some voluntary re reductions in compensation just to help the health system. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this is stuff you don't see everywhere. So we are very, very blessed. But it's also, you know, some of the worst of times. I've, I've never faced a crisis at, at this magnitude. Or, you know, financially we continue to be very, very taxed. Um, you know, the you know we we are down by about you know fifty to sixty percent of our volume, uh, fifty to sixty percent of our revenue, and and we're trying to figure out how we work our way through that. Um, and you know, the furloughing of employees has been hard on everyone. Um, it's we're close to a, you know, 100, 150 employees have been furloughed, and and again we're the largest employer of, of, in the area. That's that's ten percent of our workforce. Mm -hmm. you know, those are big numbers. Yep. And um, <coughs> so we so we we're always concerned about that, and, and we're looking forward to, to bringing them back. But um, I think you know the health system in general. I mean, we will get through this. It's a uh, all the businesses in the region are, are being, you know, are being challenged, and, and, and we're no different. But we're very appreciative of all the supports. Um, you know, Cat TV with their, you know, here's an example of the whole, you know, 
the Artists in the Shires concert series. It's an example of, of local artisans who are supporting us through their talents and, and for funds that come in. You know, donations for food the, through the meal train system. And that's another a win-win for the community as well as local um, restaurants helping our health system and our employees. So, um, you know, we're, we're moving towards a phase of ramping up and I'm gonna ask Trey to talk about that because he's, mm -hmm. you know, he's helping lead that charge and, and um, we're, we're looking forward to getting back to, to some degree of normalcy, but we know there's gonna be a new normal sure. and it's gonna take time and we're taking extraordinary steps to make sure we keep our, our community, our patients, our employees safe. And um, that's, you know, part of our mission and um, we understand that there continues to be people who are who are upset with some of our restrictions. We have, you know, we, we have restrictions, especially as it relates to the visiting hours. But that's the really to take keep our patients and our staff safe. Sure. So um, we're moving ahead. Moving uh, ahead. And things are things are continuing to be um, a time of change for us, but um, we'll we'll stay ahead of the curve. Great. Well, uh, on behalf of the community, we've said this on the show before, we want to thank you, your leadership team, and all the uh, absolutely essential workers that you have working on this crisis. Let's head over to you, Dr. Dobson. Give us an update from, uh, from a state perspective and even a regional perspective about uh, where we're at in terms of the modeling and where we're at in terms of the, the impact of the pandemic. Sure. Um, I'll start by saying from Tom and I, uh, happy Nurses Week to all the nurses out there, which started today. Um, got an incredible staff, an incredible team working hard, as, as Tom said. And we have a lot of uh, activities planned, although socially distanced, for <laughs> Nurses Week. I think people are aware that the governor came out on Monday and has uh, reduced and, uh, the restrictions on doing what, what's termed elective procedures or procedures that normally could have waited. Um, he's lifted many of those restrictions. And so we are moving forward. We have been planning because we knew eventually we would be coming. Our staff and, and our physicians are, they're concerned that there are patients out there, and we know they're there, who were not getting the care they needed, um, whether that was an acute problem uh, or chronic problems that, that over time, you know, not having the right medications, not having their blood sugar under control, their blood pressure, can lead to, you know, uh, significant problems. Uh, that would require hospitalization later. So everyone's very eager to start helping those patients. And we have plans in place. Uh, in fact, right after this, we have a large meeting where we're continuing to see these plans so that we can see patients in the operating room, so we can see them in the radiology and the lab and in the doctor's offices. We think we'll be at around 90% of our pre-pandemic volume by July 1st. Um, and that, that includes the use of telemedicine. So if patients don't need to come in, we're still gonna be doing telemedicine. That's here to stay, it's been very successful. Uh, but there are patients that need to be seen in, in person. And we're ready to do that. One of the main questions is, uh, is the hospital a safe place to come? And, and I have been saying this and I believe it and I know it to be true, it is more safe than almost any public space you would ever go to because of all the things we've put in place. Um, it looks different because all the staff are wearing covering on their face and they're wearing these things called face shields and sometimes even respirators uh, for just providing normal care and we're happy we're doing that we do that with everyone and that keeps our staff uh, very safe and our patients very safe so again um, we are opening up scheduling right now if you made a phone call to your doctor's office they may not quite be ready but we will be in a couple of days to get those appointments scheduled and uh, shooting for around 90 percent in July it is possible that this fall we're even higher than we were pre-pandemic because of this pent-up demand. Sure. In terms of the actual coronavirus, you know, for some people watching, you know, where where is Vermont on that scale? I know, I think, you know, we've, we've been doing quite well with it. Mm -hmm. And in terms of the state and the region, do, are we, do we have a couple cases? Is there mm -hmm. a lot? What's kind of the concern mm -hmm. moving forward or lack of concern? Yes. So, so right now, and we have been for almost a few weeks, we've been very stable with a low number of cases compared to many parts of the country. Um, and there's, there's various reasons for that. We've talked about some of those here. We don't have much vertical living. We're very spread out. We're still vulnerable. But what we've learned is that 
if cases start coming about here, the spread will still be slow and we should be able to contain that. Um, people still have to be very wary because they're watching TV, they're starting to get outside, they see people, they see restaurants opening up in other parts of the country. Ours will soon. We just talked about the governor just allow golf courses to open back up and people are going to get the virus. So we have to maintain that social distancing uh, even as we get out and we have to be wearing our face masks to protect others. Um, people that are very vulnerable, that are in those uh, age groups and have those disease processes that make them vulnerable, they should not be getting out and, and going uh, about pre-pandemic wise because you still don't want them to catch the illness. They need to get out and get exercise, they need to socialize in some manner, but they still, it's still going to be spreading. It's going to be spreading for a long time. This disease is with us now. Yeah. You know, Mike, also to put it in a little perspective, you know, we, we have done at the health system um, over 1,300 tests. Mm -hmm. And um, just looking at just in terms of the numbers, you know, 63 have been positive. And, and unfortunately, we've lost two people to the COVID. So, um, you know, one death is too many. Yeah. But um, mm -hmm. I think it's important to keep things in some perspective. This, this is not the New York City region. This is not even the Albany region. This mm -hmm. is... Um, you know, this is um, Southern Vermont, and um, so I think if, if people are are being cognizant, they're being careful, um, we think we can stay on top of this, but we do have those potential clusters that we have to be careful of, and, and one area that we're, we're still being very, very careful of is in our long-term care facilities, sure. which has the potential for outbreaks, and, and there have been several of those in the state of Vermont. Tom, you bring up testing, uh, and maybe both of you can speak to the availability of testing, uh, both at home um, or, you know, is there going to be more testing? We've heard kind of reports that there's still going to be a lack of that. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Any feedback or thought on testing as that goes? Sure. So we have a good capacity, very good capacity for both inpatient and outpatient testing at SVMC. The way that that you can get a test is if you have symptoms, <coughs> is your doctor will simply call the lab and then you come by into the drive-through testing. Um, that's only going to expand, assuming that the resources that are needed for the testing are available. We watch those carefully and we have to we have to maintain our supply so that we can keep our staff safe and we can reserve them for those very sick individuals. Uh, but as you may have known that the state released Monday encouragement saying we've got more equipment and more resources now please test and so we're doing that mm -hmm. great yeah we, we've been doing you know uh, we've been scheduling in the past about 25 a day we can go higher than that now mm -hmm. so I think you know the availability of testing locally is, is pretty good again talk to your physician yeah. and physicians are the ones who make that order for mm -hmm. that uh, in terms of you know I think we've heard that really any type of new normal is kind of dependent on a vaccine. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's a question that many people watching out there, and, uh, and if you are watching and you have questions like that or anything else and you're watching on Facebook, please uh, comment in the comment box and we'll, we'll try and get to those. But Dr. Dobson, where are we at in terms of a vaccine for this? Right, well, I, I know about as much as most individuals who are reading the media and reading the medical journals, um, you hear a lot that it takes 12 to 18 months uh, at the best case scenario to make a, a vaccine. But that's actually not true because we've never been in this situation, so we don't know how long it will take. We've never had a time where every country's scientists and doctors uh, are working towards the same goal with really no focus on monetary gains and very little you know, regulatory um, uh, barriers that would be in place. So I'm confident it'll be quicker than that as far as discovering the vaccine, it's disseminating the vaccine that's going to be problematic. But you are correct, if, if people want to focus on normal, in other words, pre-pandemic life, that takes either a vaccine or it takes the development of true herd immunity, which would be a couple of years. So I ask that people not focus on that, focus on more of a short term, and how can they make the best of their life with these new restrictions, uh, and we'll work on the vaccines. Great. Um, as we mentioned vaccines, as we mentioned testing, I think there's probably some concern. We've talked about golf courses, 
New York turning on a little bit sooner than us, but now Vermont is, is turning on their golf courses and other recreational outdoor activities. Uh, I'm sure Vermont looks like somewhat of an, a, a safe oasis for many uh, Connecticut, New Jersey, uh, New York for sure, in terms of we're, we've got a pretty good handle on this. Is there any fear or what is SDHC planning to do as, you know, as we loosen restrictions, as there's cross state um, kind of mingling and coming up into Vermont mm -hmm. and we may see that because people are trying to get out of cities and come up here, is there any concern around that or any kind of strategic plan around that? Mm. But definitely, and you're exactly right, you articulate that very well, uh, as people travel, now, whether it's from cities to, to the rural area or from cities to cities or rural areas to rural areas, that's how the virus is going to uh, propagate. And we know it will. So the main things are to continue doing what we've done with social distancing because that slows down that transmission significantly. Uh, and, and by doing that, it doesn't mean you can't get out and participate in those things you mentioned, the outdoor uh, uh, recreation and the golf but it does mean that we have to still maintain the masks we're wearing and the social distance. And if you notice, people are doing a really good job. And that is why our cases are down. Mm -hmm. yeah. You know, and one reality, Matt, too, is um, our health system really is a tri-state health system. I mean, now we, we, have, we have locations and presence in, in, of course, Vermont, but New York and in the Berkshires. Uh, more and more of our business is coming from the Northern Berkshire region mm -hmm. and from New York. So, um, you know, it's, that's kind of our mission now is, is, is to service the community within this whole re Southern Vermont region. And, um, and so we will, we will be seeing more, more folks who, have, who live in um, sure. New York and Massachusetts. And, um, you know, we're just going to have to, you know, deal with that. And, and um, again, I, I just want to encourage as, as Dr. Dobson said, our, our health system is a safe health system to come to. And you know, Matt, you said strategic plan. So that's, and you asked about SVMC, that's us working with the health department. Um, one of the big ways to stave off clusters from growing is to identify them quickly. So that's where we sure. come in. And then is to do the contact tracing that you've been reading about, and that's where the health department comes in. And it does really work. We've seen it work in other countries. Mm -hmm but it takes the resources yeah. to do it. And the health department is gearing up yes. in a pretty significant way. Yeah. Uh, you know, a thousand employees have been hired to uh, contract tracing. So that's, that's gonna be something that they're gonna play a, a greater role in. Great, we had a question come in, we'll jump right to that. Um, have a question about when can uh, people visit their loved ones? And so we had talked a little bit before about restricted time, but maybe either Tom or Dr. Dobson just talk about the whole spectrum of visiting family while at, at one of SDHC's locations. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. So um, the governor did mention that in, in the press release, and it still has restricted uh, visitors in the hospital. So we're going to have to continue to reevaluate that. There are certain criteria that we, that we allow. For example, uh, the partner of... of a woman giving birth is allowed and, and has been. Uh, someone who is not doing very well is very sick and, and may pass. Family members are allowed, you know, one at a time or two at a time. And we're going to keep it that way because every new person that comes in, even though they're there to see their loved one, um, is, is at risk of bringing in the virus. And that's part of how we keep it safe. Now, we have all the all the plans in place and all of the uh, resources to keep the virus from propagating throughout the system. But until we reach a point where we're not worried about it, we're going to have to keep some restrictions in place. But again, if someone is very ill uh, and, and needs to be seen, we allow that to happen. And probably realistically, there will be a lag in terms of the CLR, our nursing home, in mm -hmm. terms of visitors. Again, very high risk population. And we know how difficult this is in terms of really not having um, people come in to visit them and they're living there, that's their home. So uh, we're staying very close to the Department of Health in this one in terms of their recommendations and they're putting a higher level of focus right now on long-term care. Okay. Uh, in terms of, of, we had mentioned earlier, outpatient services, uh, what, is that, um, what does that mean? You know, uh, give us some uh, real uh, tangible things that people are going to start to see come back online at this hospital and others. Sure, I need to go see my mm -hmm. cardiologist for my every four-month checkup, and 
As a part of that, I get an echocardiogram down in the hospital. Those things have been put on hold during this, and now all those restrictions have been lifted. So we are, uh, we are doing those things now, I mean, starting yesterday, or what's the, yeah, the day before, and we're moving forward with that. Um, we still will screen on the phone beforehand, screen for uh, temperature and other questions that, that people are probably used to. And anything that doesn't have to come in and be seen, we'll do through telemedicine. Mm. Great. Now, there still is restrictions, Matt, on elective uh, surgical procedures that are going to require inpatient admission. So those are mm -hmm. ones which are still, um, have not been lifted yet, but we're hoping those will be lifted in a relatively near future. Great. We just did uh, a couple of joint replacements. Uh, when the governor lifted, yeah. we were ready to go, right. and those went well. Hard to believe. Those are all outpatient. outpatient now. In the no. old days, those would be right. a, a week stay. Now they're outpatient. Well, I, I do have a question sooner or later here about the vision of a new health care. And, Tom, I want you to speak to that a little bit. But first, let's get to, to some of these Facebook questions. Um, I have a Facebook question about home antibody testing, and if positive, how or should they report? Yeah. So... Um, Antibody testing is, of course, all throughout the media, and it does have potential to be a great resource. Um, we use it in other diseases, and it works really well. The problem is this disease is so new, we don't know if a particular antibody test by a particular company works. That's the first point. So that's why the um, FDA announced Monday they're going to start, and they already did. They said they gave, they gave the uh, companies 10 days to prove that their test works and they've approved a, a few of those. And by that, that the test really identifies this particular virus and not another virus. The second is, if the test is positive, does the person have any immunity to not get the disease for some time period? And that is what we don't know right now, but I feel confident we will within a few months, I believe we'll, we'll have that question answered. So back to this person, I would have to know which antibody test they were using. We do know some of them uh, are approved now. And then why they, what their intent is for using it. So all it says is you have had the virus, but it doesn't say whether or not you can get it again. And that's, that's the question we need answered. Okay, great. And I'm just kind of scrolling through. So don't mind me on uh, Facebook. If you do have a question for Dr. Dobson, or Tom D, CEO of Southwestern Vermont Medical Center. Uh, we've got a couple more minutes left, so we want to uh, get to as many questions as possible. Uh, here's one. Uh, how does Vermont feel about a wedding in August? This may be a little bit out of your jurisdiction, <laughs> uh, but, but since we have you here, right now, what is the projected number of people that can gather while maintaining social distancing? So I think we'll, we'll see that evolve Mm -hmm. as time goes mm -hmm. on, but maybe remind our audience where we're currently at with that and maybe some hypothesis of where we may be in August. Sure. Well, geez, uh, I, I did not get a chance to catch the governor's conference at 10 a.m. today, so he may have put some, he may have said some things beyond the golf course uh, restrictions being lifted as far as gathering. It's my understanding he has not lifted any of the gathering. Um, he's lifted uh, restrictions on workplace gathering, which is a little different than, than social gathering and he still maintains the distance and the masks being worn. So predicting August is, is really like looking in a crystal ball. Um, I can imagine a wedding going on in August. I, I imagine that also to have to have social distancing and I imagine masks to be in place. Sure. I will tell you from a health system standpoint, we have, and we hold many community events, we have put all our community events on hold this, throughout the summer. Yeah. So we're, we're not expecting um, right now, and we're kind of looking at September as a, as a new time frame for planning purposes. Um, this is kind of a, a, a maybe a trick question, but... Um, That's a question for Troy, then. Uh, yeah, right. <laughs> uh, what, is the, what is the outpatient, what does this mean for reopening the hospital? I think the punchline here is that you guys have never been closed. Never been closed. Never yeah. been closed. Mm -hmm. So... Um, so kudos to, to you both and your team for remaining open. Mm -hmm. um, I did uh, allude to kind of a, a more philosophical question, Tom, and I'm sure you're, you're seeing this with your peers and, and Dr. Dobson mm -hmm. even with yours. As we kind of, you know, necessity breeds innovation, mm -hmm. and we have seen that time and time again, mm -hmm. especially in the last 60 days for, for the healthcare system, 
what does this mean for the future of healthcare? What are, what are some things, what are some silver linings? We've talked a little bit about telemedicine, how that kind of propelled us forward even more in the last 60 days uh, in terms of, of looking for a vaccine and trying to produce one faster than ever before. I'm sure we'll, we'll, we'll do a lot of uh, looking back and saying, wow, wasn't that amazing? What are you seeing in, when you talk to your peers and colleagues across the United States? In terms yeah, of the, you know, two organizations, institutions, tend to move the slowest out there. And I would say healthcare is one mm -hmm. and education is probably the other. I think what we've all learned is it's amazing how quickly things have changed over a period of a sh very short period of time. And I think the healthcare system to, uh, to survive and also to thrive into the future has to adopt the rapid cycle changes that many um, in um, businesses and industries uh, have right now, and it's, that's something I think we're learning that we can't, we can't be a dinosaur and we can't move slowly as we have in the past. We have to move towards innovation, and I think that's one of the things um, that we're instilling in, in, in our thought process these days is how can we meet the public's me uh, demand and meet it at a much quicker way. And I'll and I also say, and this is something we've been doing a lot of, we in terms of collaboration and working with other or, other organizations. People may may have forgot a little bit because COVID's dominated everything, but we have a major plan afoot to cons to work closely with Dartmouth Hitchcock. Mm -hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I think this pandemic is is an example of where working together is a very positive thing. So I, I view once this thing dies down a little bit in terms of the, the timing and how it's consumed our attention, we'll get back to that very quickly to see if we can come together and put joint plans that will help service the needs of our people or our community here. Well, and not to mention a campus improvement project as well that you have working. a we <laughs> have a you know very significant um, modernization upgrade um, program. The first phase is our, is our emergency room and this pandemic has highlighted the need to have a state-of-the-art emergency room and, and we intend to pursue that with full vigor once the, really the state is starting to look at applications again. So Matt, you, you talked about uh, necessity breeds innovation and that's absolutely correct and then innovation leads to better outcomes for patients. So if you talk about telemedicine, which is an, a great example, there's really four barriers that have been in place. One's technology, but I'd say we're 85% the way there. Anybody can do it on their phone. We just lack a little bit of the procedural abilities that, that could come about. Um, then there's, there's doctor acceptance, probably around 25 to 50% now, and patient acceptance, which is probably near 75%. And then there's this barrier called the regulatory payer barrier where places aren't getting reimbursed for it. You know, we pass laws, but they really just don't come to fruition. That's what this pandemic has removed so that we don't have to worry about those and we can say, how can we deliver the best care possible? And for many people, that'll be through telemedicine. And for others, it won't be. So it'll be some combination. I hear a lot of predictions. Everything will be telemedicine. That's not true. Nothing will be telemedicine. That's not true. It'll be somewhere in the middle. That's usually where we find the sweet spot, right. among other things. I would say the same is true. Uh, everything from when we look at businesses and work, right. uh, I think you know there's a there's a good uh, there's a good silver lining in the fact that I think Vermont could well position itself to be uh, kind of the, the stay at home but work from home state moving forward, right. uh, uh, and people can work in, in cities but live in the great Green yeah. Mountain State. And I, and I think you know another silver lining is more and more people discovering Vermont coming up here. And yeah. you know, so I think hopefully for the economic standpoint, um, I know we've had a, a major problem with not workforce and not enough people. I think we will be seeing more people coming up here. Mm -hmm. Final question, we try and do this every telecast. How is the staff doing? How is the morale of the staff? And, and if you could, both of you, weave in, again, those kind of community-based mm. efforts that have been, I think, helping the staff mm. get through this. But first, how's the staff doing? I think the staff is amazing. Um, Trey mentioned um, today's a kickoff of Nursing Week. We have a week of activities and, and a little lower key this year because of what's going on. But um, I think it's a, it's a great opportunity to to recognize the team of people who I think um, really have such an impact in all of our lives, and um, and and we are we're blessed to have one of the best uh, nursing teams in the country here.
-hmm. and and our our clinical team of physicians and technologists and support staff. I mean, there's really, um, this is a, a great group of people and they are holding strong, they're, they're strong, you know, and um, I think all the support they receive, they, they feed off of that. Mm -hmm. And it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's so, you know, they are, it's been terrific. You know, I think people have been showing me, I, I think you may have saw in the newspaper some of those, the, 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 um, the MAC masks that were made, the respirator masks, and people wearing those and are proud to have them. Yeah. And it's, um, you know, those are just examples of the community reaching out to, and through innovation helping to deal with this pandemic. Sure. I would say that um, they are doing very well. They are eager to start taking care of more patients, whether they're COVID patients or non-COVID patients. Um, they're worried about them and they have their heart into how can we continue to provide this care. So I think they're looking forward to the next several weeks. Mm -hmm. There's some anxiety, uh, but uh, they're, they want people to know the hospital is a safe place and they're doing the right thing to keep them safe. I also just want the community and, and ourselves to remember that we fortunately did not have this surge of patients with a lot of death and, and, and despair, um, and we need to celebrate that. There is the pain of the fact that we have to move forward in, a, in an economy that's suffering and, and in a healthcare system that, that needs to get patients back in, but we do have staff that will continue to be taking care of, of these COVID patients. Um, long hours in, these, in this equipment, and it's not easy. And so we celebrate the fact that we didn't have lots of patients, but we have to, to acknowledge these, the, the nurses in the ICU and on the floors and the doctors that are going in and out of the rooms, and that will continue to be difficult. Sure. And, and to remind our audience, there is a, a COVID relief fund, and you, they can visit the hospital's website. Uh, there is also a meal train, which is a partnership with the Chamber of Commerce. I think we're going to roll out another type of meal train yeah. partnership in the next week with the hospital. Um, and I just want to thank our guest, Tom D. and Dr. Trey Dobson, for being here, updating us. We know that this is beneficial to the community. And, and if it's beneficial to you, if you're enjoying these or at least being informed by these and being educated by these, leave us a little note in the comment box uh, down at Cat TV or, or send a quick note over to Cat TV. Let us know that we're on the right track and that you, uh, that you would like us to continue to do these. And we will continue to do these as the, uh, as the hospital, the chamber, and Cat TV partner together to educate and inform our community. So once again, thank you so much for joining us here today.